morning. Y'all can be seated. Open your Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. All of you watching by live stream, thank you, or joining us. Let me say joining us by live stream because you're doing more than watching. Many of you are just really into this. In your Bibles, you sing, you stand when we stand, you pray when we pray. I have so many of you tell me that. I praise God for that. Others of you play video games while you're listening a little bit. So that's between you and the Lord, but I've heard you tell me that too. So, <laughs> Oh, goodness. So to those in Israel especially, now to, this, is, this message is for the world, and it has practical application to your life and my life today and tomorrow when we leave. But we're going to set some stage here. We're going to set some biblical historical context and some Orthodox Judaism context and some Messianic understanding, that is how Jesus ties into all of this context, and then we're going to bring it down to what this means for us, and when we walk out of those doors, how does it touch or change our lives? So I've only got four hours to do all of that in, so please just bear with me. Mm -hmm. Preach, <laughs> preach. I know, yeah. It's raining outside. There's a storm going outside. Let's just have fun here. Okay, but here's, here's the deal. For, for those that are joining us by Israel, first of all, happy Rosh Hashanah and happy Yom Tuvah. Um, God bless you. You, you know what I'm saying. A lot of these folks know what I'm saying. Messianic Rabbi Zev Parat and his wife Lynn, they are watching live right now. Hey, guys. And we love you so much. Rabbi Zev, we wish you could be here. I wish you could be here preaching this message. No, let me change it. They wish you could be here <laughs> preaching the message this morning. But thank you for allowing me to be a part of your ministry. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your ministry. And we're so excited that you're a part of our ministry, you and your family. And all of those that you are ministering to now, some that you have personally led to the Lord, who are now watching and a part of this church family, and we praise God for you. And so, happy Rosh Hashanah and Yom Tuwa. Uh, a lot of you know, but the words Rosh Hashanah in Hebrew mean head of the year. That's how it literally translates in English. It would be Happy New Year or New Year's, <laughs> New Year's celebration. Now, this is a bit confusing for um, Gentiles and people in America because, you know, we say, well, New Year's is January 1st, and we see the Israelis on January 1st, they're shooting fireworks and everything. What, what is, well, and a lot of people will say, well, it's the Jewish New Year. Well, th that's true. For a long time, that has been the tradition in Israel, but it is not the biblical New Year. And let me just do a little explaining here, and our Messianic friends know that I'm not disparaging the Jewish people. This goes deep in their tradition but the truth of the matter is, is that in Exodus 12, when the children of Israel who'd been in slavery for 400 years were getting ready to be delivered out by the blood of the lamb over the doorpost and in the house and Moses getting that command from the Lord God himself in the burning bush, he comes before Pharaoh, all of that happens. And now it's time for the Passover, the 10th plague of death that will go throughout the land on the firstborn unless you're under the blood of the Lamb. And it's time for Passover. And God says to Moses, as he's telling you, choose your lamb on the 10th day of Nisan. And on the 14th day, you slaughter that lamb. And then you put the blood over the doorpost in a certain way. By the way, that certain way, I've preached this many times, but it forms the shape of the cross. You put the blood at the top, you put the blood on the sides, and you do it with a hyssop branch, nothing else. And then 1,500 years later, we see Jesus, who is the Lamb, blood in his hands, blood with the, the, the crown of thorns around his head, dripping down to the floor before. But in the same way over the doorpost, it would drip down to the threshold. And they lifted up the sponge on a hyssop branch. You lift it up on the hyssop branch 1,500 years early. Don't you know that the people coming out of Israel probably were questioning Moses like, why all of these exacting, the 10th, the 14th, a uh, a branch, nothing else, some up here, some here, some here, only a lamb, a male lamb, a perfect male lamb, go into the house, everybody under the blood, anybody who comes under the blood, Jew or Gentile. I mean, the, the Hebrew people, the, the book of Exodus tells us that all of these, you know, a million something Jews came out and it said, and the nations that were among them came out with them. We'll say, how'd that happen? Because for 400 years, they had grown up among all of the people in Egypt, and they had witnessed to them of the glory and power and majesty of Yahweh. And once they knew the gospel in their day, the way of salvation, they invited their friends, get under the blood with us. 
lest you and your family be destroyed on judgment day. And the ones that came under the blood, Jew or Gentile. See, for God so loved the world, not just the Jewish people, and not just the Baptist on the Gulf Coast. God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, I'm going to say this, would get under the blood shall be saved. Amen? Amen. So, so what's happening is they come out. They come out, and that is the only Passover time. Everything else is a commemoration of Passover, looking back. Like Thanksgiving in America. There's only one original Thanksgiving, but every one after that is a commemoration of that original one. So at that Passover, they come out. Well, they go into the wilderness. They eventually wind up at Mount Sinai. About 40, 50 days later, the Orthodox Jews to this day celebrate the giving of the law, they celebrate it as a part of the celebration of Pentecost, which was 40 days later. We find that very powerful and fascinating because on Pentecost, Israel was born by the giving of the law, the nation of Israel. On Pentecost, the church was born by the giving of the Holy Spirit, which writes the law, who he writes the law on our hearts. Do you see the connection there? Israel and the church, Israel and the church, all through the Bible, we are the witnesses to the world. A returned Israel sitting in the Middle East right now that hadn't been there for 2,800 years is the fig tree that bloomed and is a witness to the world that we are living in the last days. Now, when I say last days, we don't set dates. I don't know if it's this week, next month, 10 years from now, two generations from now. But I'm telling you, the return of the Lord is so very soon, heavenly speaking. A thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. But we are 72 years on the other side of the rebirth of Israel. And now Jews from all over Israel are being saved through the gospel. Hickory Hammock has a small part in that. But I praise God for any part we have. Join together Messianic Rabbi who has, Zebrat, who has a huge part in that. And, and we're allowed to be a part of that ministry. So it's all connected. We're connected to all of that. But when they came out, they go into the promised land. They all the nation is born. For 40 years, they're in the wilderness. And you know why. We'll talk about all that later, maybe in another message. But what we're going to see in Joshua 6 is they come out of the wilderness finally 40 years later. Moses has died. Joshua leads them in to the promised land. That's interesting because Joshua is the English word for Yeshua. His name was Yeshua. Yeshua leads them into the promised land. Yeshua is translates all over through Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English. It finally makes it out of our tongues as Jesus. Of course, Joshua was not Jesus. He was a type. It's a, it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's a parable. It's an illustration. It's a type. Here's this man named Yeshua who's leading God's people into the promised land. But there are battles. I mean, for 40 years they've been coming. It's now they've got to cross a flooding river. Do we know anything about that? The Jordan is in its flood stages. They got to go across a flooding river. Then they get there, and you know what day they land in the promised land after they cross over? 40 years to the day. It's now the day of Passover. 40 years. Passover, they were released 40 years later on Passover. Y'all can say amen if it's cool, because I mean, otherwise I'm thinking you don't get it. <laughs> I'm preaching, you're going, huh? <laughs> But no, but this is, this is huge. So, so right now, though, Rosh Hashanah means head of the year, new year. But Exodus 12, God says, this is to be the beginning. Passover is to be your new year. Well, that's April, March, April in our calendar. But that's the beginning of the official new year. So where did this Rosh Hashanah in September come from? It happens to fall on the feast day of Yom Tuah, which means the day of the trumpets, okay? The day of the trumpets, or the feast of the trumpets, the day of the trumpets, Yom is the day. Well, how, how, how's that? Well, it's a long story. I'm going to make it very short, then we're going to move on because it's not necessarily essential to this, but I want you to understand in case you get confused or if somebody asks you about it. The bottom line is the ancient rabbis after Israel had basically been destroyed as a nation, Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians. They were taken off into Babylon. The Babylonians 
their new year, a lot of the pagan Middle Eastern people way back then, thousands of years ago, their new year started in the fall. And so the ancient Jews who are now assimilated and living in the midst of it, they assimilated, they knew that they had a fall feast coming up called the Feast of Trumpets. And so the shouting, the blowing of trumpets, they just kind of put the two together and said, well, we'll celebrate at the same time they're celebrating, and we'll call it whatever, whatever they want to call it, we will, but we're going to celebrate our feast in the midst of it. And so it just kept going down through the ages. And so now even in the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, of course they know that January 1st is kind of the, where the whole world kind of celebrates a new year. But then they have Passover, which is the what you would call, I guess, the rabbinical new year or the, 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 the sacrificial new year because that's what Exodus 12 says. And then, see, there's really three new years, if you will, in Israel among the Orthodox and the believers. And then you get over into the fall and there's the Feast of Trumpets. And so the nation also celebrates that because it goes all the way back to their Jewish heritage in Babylon. Does that make sense? It's not a biblical mandate. It's not a biblical command. But that's okay. Not disparaging folks that celebrate it in Israel. It's a big deal in Israel, just like New Year's is a big deal here. But what is a big deal in Israel among the Orthodox and especially among the Messianics, that is, Jews that have believed and come to Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach as Lord and Savior, is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, these feasts, we call them feasts as Zev has taught us right from this pulpit, and as I have reiterated over and over, the word we translate in our English as feast is, is the Hebrew word is moed. And it can mean a feast or a holy convocation or a rehearsal. And that's really the better word, as Zev has taught us, because rehearsal, rehearsal, each of those feasts, they had purposes. They, they, there was an agricultural society, and so a lot of them, well, Passover was the the, the, the celebration of, it's like the Thanksgiving service, the celebration of coming out of slavery, okay? But in that same week is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, what was that? Well, that's God gave them manna from heaven, uh, you know, that lasted forever. And then they brought, they were ordered to, to cook bread without leaven. Why? Because leaven is yeast. And without it, it's not as tasty, but it lasts a long time. See, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. The world thinks I'm not as tasty as all the glitz and glamour they offer you. But if you eat of me, you live forever. You eat of that, you rot. The yeast will rot in your gut and you will rot and spend eternity for me. But you eat of me. I am the unleavened bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread. See, all of these, Passover, the Feast of Passover. How, did, how were they? What is that about? It's about getting under the blood of the Lamb. You see how all this is about Jesus? Then right after that is the Feast of First Fruits. It always falls on the Sunday after the Sabbath, which is a Saturday, Friday night to Saturday night for the Orthodox, um, after Passover, which is right there in the same week. So that week of the crucifixion, you had Passover, upon which Jesus was crucified. Then you had, of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which came right after it. And, and oftentimes the two are put together. Jews will often refer to it as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, meaning Passover and Unleavened Bread, the whole bit. But the Feast of First Fruits celebrates the beginning of the first harvest coming in, the first fruits. Well, it was on the Feast of First Fruits on that Sunday when Jesus rose from the grave. And see, all through the New Testament, Paul says Jesus is our first fruit who has risen from there. He is our unleavened bread. He is our Passover lamb. Even the book of Revelation says he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Peter says he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So we see that all of these feasts were about him all along. That's why they're called moeds. They're rehearsals for the real thing. What's the real thing? Jesus fulfilling everything. Pentecost, 40, 50 days, excuse me, 50 days after the Feast of, uh, of First Fruits, was the birth of the church. Well, it was also the birth of Israel, the Orthodox Jews say. Wow, the two witnesses of the world. Israel, you're my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses to, Gen to the Gentiles. In the last days, God says, and I will bring them back to the land and put them in the Middle East. They will be my witnesses. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses to the earth. Where did we come from? From Israel. I mean, I mean, we did. The true Israel is Jew and Gentile under the blood of the Lamb. Well, can Jews be saved without Jesus? No. Can Gentiles be saved? No. It comes to the Father but by me. Who was he speaking to? Twelve disciples. Who were they? Jews. What did he tell them? Even you. 
You're not getting in because you're a Jew. You're getting in because I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and you're going to come through me. Everybody hear me? This is important stuff. And think, we've got an international audience. This is important for the world to hear this stuff. So Rosh Hashanah, you hear it, you see it in the news. It's Rosh Hashanah in Israel. It's the new year. Well, now you understand the connection there. Is really not, but but it's a good thing. It's a big celebration and a day off and a day of rest and a Sabbath for the Jews and so and for Israel. So that's cool. But more importantly, it's Yom Turah, Yom Yom Turah, Turah, Turah. That word Turah. I'm going to get to Joshua here. It it in Leviticus 23 where it says, blow the trumpets on that day, on that day. Of the seven feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, Yom Tuvah, completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and he's the one that birthed the church. He's told his disciples, now you go and wait. I'm sending the Holy Spirit from the Father's throne. And the church will be born, and then you are to be my witnesses. Fifty days later on Pentecost, the church was born. Peter preaches 3,000 people are saved, and it hasn't stopped for 2,000 years. Amen. I'm, yeah, yeah, give the Lord a hand. Don't, don't, don't. Until 2020. And it didn't really stop, but good gosh, what a weeding out. <laughs> what a sifting. <laughs> what a test. I've already preached on that. Let me hush. It's going through my mind. Say this, say that. No, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> we'll be here for hours. But listen, I'm going to stay on track. But when you get to those seven feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, as it's called, Yom Tuah, is the only feast that all it says is, on the first day of the tenth month, blow the trumpets throughout the land. That's all it says doesn't say because we're bringing in the harvest or because of this or because of that. And then the next feast is called Yom Kippur, the day of the covering or the day of atonement or the day of judgment if you're not covered by the blood. That's when the high priest goes in one time a year behind into the Holy of Holies, takes the blood of the Lamb, sprinkles it on the altar. If he does it right and if the people are repentant, then God passes over their sin of their national sin and even their personal sin. But between the blowing of the trumpet and the day of atonement is 10 days. This was set aside in Leviticus 23. It said then on the 10th day of the seventh month, I said, I think I said the first day of the 10th month. It's the first day of the seventh month and on the 10th day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. So between the blowing of the trumpets and Yom Kippur, among the Hebrew people, it's known as the days of awe, the 10 days of awe. Why? Because those trumpets, they know those trumpets are, they, there was nothing else attached to it in the commandment, but they know the sounding of the shofar throughout the land. You know, and we play them in here a lot and over on video, and, and, and it, it, that, that sound is awesome as it bounces off the hills and rolls off the ricochets off the rocks of the mountains, and it just builds and builds and builds, and it's just, it puts chill bumps on you, and it just, it's holy. It's a, it's a, it's a terrifying sound if you've, you've never heard it before, and it just starts blasting. Yet, we're told over and over again, that those trumpets, they were calls to worship, they were calls to battle, they were calls to war, they were calls announcing the arrival of a king. Trumpets blaring. So on the days of trumpets, what happens? You just blow the trumpet throughout the land. Why? Well, because 10 days later comes the day that you better be under the blood. So you got 10 days to get your heart and life right. Because then... The judgment of God comes unless you're under the blood. And if you're under the blood, his judgment is lifted off of you. Do you see the connection to all of this, folks? So the spring feast, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, those have all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the birth of the church. The last three, the fall feast, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles, those have not been completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so many believe that the blowing of the trumpet 
attached to the rapture of the church and the return of the Lord. We find that in Matthew 24. We find it in 1 Corinthians 15. And we find it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The blowing of the trumpet, the blowing of the trumpet, the blowing of the trumpet, the shout from heaven, the shout of God, the shout of the Lord, the gathering up of his people, sending out his angels throughout the earth to gather them up. You find it in those three verses in the New Testament connected to the Tuah. The word Tuah is often translated as a trumpet blast. There's different words for trumpets and shofars, but that word, when you see Tuah, it can mean a shout. You go through the Psalms and it says, Shout to the Lord, all ye earth. Shout out to God. Give him praise and glory. It says, Tuah to the Lord throughout the earth. Tuah to the Lord. Tuah to God and give him glory. Well, so it can mean make a loud noise. It can be a blasting out of a sound from heaven. It can be out of the mouths of God's people. Or it can be taking up your shofars and blasting out. Does all of this make sense? Tuah means all of it. Zeb's over there going, Amen, brother. Amen, amen. But no, but, but that's what it means. I'm telling you all this on purpose because you're going to see something. I'm going to make some more amazing connections. So today, the people of Israel are celebrating the New Year's. They're blasting the shofars. Now, in Orthodox Judaism, again, this is not the New Year according to the Bible. But the rabbis said so a long time ago, so they continue. The rabbis also said we're going to use this as the celebration of the beginning of of creation, when God created everything and when he created Adam and Eve and the trumpets of heaven sounded. And that probably did happen. <laughs> and the angels celebrated. We know that from the book of Job. So I don't have a problem with people using the feast of trumpets also as just a time of remembering God did all of this. God created us. God created the heavens and the earth. He's the one that breathed life into our beings. So that's pretty cool. But again, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere, that now the Feast of Trumpets is to, to celebrate Adam and Eve being born. <laughs> but that's a good connection. So all of that's happening in Israel right now. New Year's Day, remembering the creation of the world and Adam and Eve, which happened in the area of what we now call Israel. Read Gods of Ground Zero. <laughs> You'll see all of the evidence for it in that book that I wrote. It's quite astounding, not the book, but the evidence that's just throughout the scriptures and throughout history. That's where it all started, and that's where it's all going to culminate. That's where the Lord is returning. Amen? That's what the Bible says. That's where the ruling and reigning will take place from, according to the word of God. It's where it all began. It's where it's going to culminate. But the sounding of the trumpet... The feast that says nothing else but just blow the trumpets. But then when you look ahead, you say, oh my gosh. <laughs> but there's also a looking back. You'll see it in just a moment. Now I want you to look ahead because once they came into the land of Israel, they crossed the flooded Jordan River, which parted like the Red Sea, literally. The priests went ahead with the Ark of the Covenant, blowing trumpets and worshiping. They walk in. It's Passover. They celebrate Passover. The manna stops. They're eating from the fruit of the land. But guess what lies before them? The walled fortress of Jericho represents, if you want to speak metaphorically, it represents the evil of the world, the power of the nations, the world, a great walled fortress. These are people that have been desert nomads for 40 years, carting around their temple as a tent with them. They step across the river and they're looking at a great walled city. They would have to have all kinds of weaponry and technology. They don't have any of it. Say, so what are we going to do? Because these people are going to come out. They're going to kill us all. We just got the promised land and now we're staring death in the face. And God says, I can handle this. I'm going to take you out upon the waters where you have never tricked. And you're going to watch me work. Look at Joshua 6. This is what he tells him. Verse 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, Behold, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Here's what you are to do. This sounds like, now look, go take a lamb, put its blood over the doorpost, <laughs> Get inside 
and I'll deliver you from all the superpower of the world, Egypt, from Pharaoh, from all of his armies, from all of his chariots. Just put some blood, just sprinkle some blood of a lamb on your house and you'll be fine. He said, what? But they did it. The ones that did it were saved. Listen to this. They're looking at Jericho. So I'm going to give you the king and their whole army. Well, how? What are we going to do? Watch, watch, watch. Calling you out upon the waters. Verse 3. March around the city once with all the armed men. You're going to see this armed men over and over. Yes, Christians, it's okay to arm yourselves. We're not to overthrow governments. We're not out trying to shoot and kill people. But when it comes to protecting your family, when you're just worshiping God, it's all right to be armed. God's people have always been commanded by God. Arm yourselves. Don't be thugs. You're not criminals. You're not government overthrowers. But you cannot let people destroy you while you're worshiping the Lord. Here we go. March around the city once with all of your armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets. That would be seven trumpets. Seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns. Those would be shofars. All right, everybody with me? Shofar, show good? Yeah. Do this. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, isn't this interesting? What does that sound like? Genesis, six days, you do this and create and create. But on the seventh day, something very holy is going to happen. You see this? This is important. This ties together to what Israel's doing now, ties together what we are living and our lives as we walk out of these doors. Hang on. I'm going to pull it all together. Just hang on. All right. You have seven priests carry seven trumpets in front of the ark. On the seventh day now, you march around the city seven times. You say, gosh, that's a lot of sevens. Yes, and there's a reason for it. With the priest blowing the trumpets, when you hear them sound a long blast to wah on the trumpets, have all of the people give a loud to wah. You see it? The shout, the blast, the trumpets. That word kind of encompasses it all. That's the feast of Tuwa, the feast, the Yom Tuwa, the day of the trumpets, the day of the shouting, the day of the blasting. Everybody with me? Give a loud to wah. Then the wall of the city will collapse on that seventh day, and the people, your people, will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua, this is the only man in the Bible has no parents. Look what it says. Son of none. I'm just trying to help you understand the Bible. And have a little fun with it at the same time. See, I got people out here laughing. I got other people looking at me going, Lighten up. It's the Lord's day. We're alive. We survived a hurricane. All right? He's the son of Nun. He had no parents. No, Nun's his dad's name. N-U-N. Okay. So here we go. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. So Joshua, verse 6, the son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, Okay, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, have seven priests, carry those seven trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance! You know what he did there? He tuwad. <laughs> he shouted. March around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. See, there it is again. Yeah, but you know God's people shouldn't carry guns. Well, they did. Verse 8. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord... They went forward, blowing their trumpets. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard, there it is again, marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets. And the rear guard followed the ark. And all this time, the trumpets were sounding. Can you imagine what that would have sounded? Imagine being inside those walled cities and seeing a million and a half people circling your city, blowing trumpets. Some of them had a little fear because that sound of those trumpets was pretty awesome. Others of them were probably laughing and mocking. That's all you got? 
We got bows and arrows. Come a little closer. Come in. You're just outside the range of our bows, but as soon as you come a little closer, we'll kill you all. You're going to blow trumpets and walk around our city carrying a box? That's the kind of stuff that they were enduring. I'm glad nobody mocks us like that, aren't you? That's all you got? Go down that church. You don't need to go to church. You're, unes- you're not even essential. Now, casinos are. Big box stores, that's all essential. But churches are not essential. That's all you got. Well, we need to go. We need to pray and worship. That's all you got. You're going to go down and say little prayers. Hicker Hammock prayed. We prayed scripture over us and nothing touched us. Jericho was right before our face and we just blew the trumpets and stood in the word. We're into the 11th month now. We never shut our doors. In fact, we've been doing what? Ministering and missions all over the Gulf Coast and taking care of people among us. Less than a handful with a finger or two left over from our midst, went home, went to bed, sick for a few days, yuck, came back. Nobody went to the hospital. Nobody put on respirators. Nobody died. We just did life. We have more people in the hospitals during flu season from this church and from, than we did with COVID. Now, COVID's real. COVID's bad. Certain demographics, it'll kill you. I get that. But I'm saying there's something about living in faith and taking God at his word because the word's looking at, the world's looking at us saying, that's all you got. And I'm looking back at them saying, how'd that work out for you? Yeah, thank you. That's all we need. How'd that work out? That's all we needed. Amen, church? Y'all help me out. Everybody's watching around the world. Now, if they don't hear you say amen, they're going to say, look, they're disagreeing with that preacher. They think that preacher's crazy. Well, no, never mind. They do think I'm crazy. But I ain't got nothing to do with the word of God, though. Okay, watch this. All of this time, the trumpets were sounding. Verse 10. But Joshua had commanded the people, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices yet. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to. And when I tell you to, to, to ra, to ra, then to ra. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. Then the people returned to camp and spent the night there. Let me just go ahead because I got a lot more to preach. So here's what happens. So the seventh day came. Now the seven priests with the seven trumpets went around the city seven times, blowing the trumpets as they went around the city. At the last time, on the seventh time, on the seventh day, by the seven priests blowing the seven trumpets, Joshua said, Tua! Tua! Shout for the Lord, praise him, shout his name, Elohim, Yahweh, shout, shout, worship, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. (laughs) Probably an earthquake or something. And everything just started, the whole earth started roiling under their feet. Next thing you know, walls, bricks, and stones are coming down. Then the whole walls are coming down. The people inside are panicking. They were up on the wall saying, that's all you got. Next thing you know, they're saying... And the people of God are saying, that's enough. (laughs) You ain't nothing. How'd that work out for you? And they go in. And they completely capture the city. And now the promised land is theirs. Now there's a picture there, is there not? Well, you say, is Yom Kippur related to this? Well, kind of, sort of. See, it was given at Mount Sinai. The book of Leviticus, that was a part of the law. But watch. Do you know the first time we hear a shofar blow in the Bible? The first time? Is it in Genesis? No. I'm sure they did in the heavenlies and all that, the creation and the angels in heaven. But the Bible doesn't say anything about shofars blowing. You know when the first time we hear of shofars blowing? Exodus chapter 19. You know what Exodus chapter 20 is? The giving of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 19. The million and a half, two million people have gathered at the foot of Sinai. And the mountaintop erupts into a blaze. And the Bible says 10,000 times, 10,000 holy ones came through another dimension and circled the top of the mountain And they were shouting glory to God. They were to why? Glory to God. 
and the ram's horns were blowing. The trumpets were blowing. The trumpets of heaven and the people, many of them just fainted into the dust, wouldn't you? And they heard the voice of God. I've preached on this before. It's right there in your Bible. Some of you said, no, Carl, they didn't hear the voice. Moses heard, "Uh uh-uh, the people did. The Old Testament says it, and the New Testament says it. I'll show you that again in another message. I've already preached it, but I've been here 30 years, so when I say that, I'm thinking, yeah, but that was 23 years ago when I preached that. We'll do it, but just follow me. In fact, Hebrews 11 talks about how we, however, under the blood of Jesus, we have not come to a mountain filled with fire where 10,000 times 10,000 voices were shouting and the trumpets were blowing. We have not come to a mountain of holy terror. We have come to the great high priest, the Savior of our souls, Jesus Christ. We have come to a new mountain. We have come to a new day. We have come to a new covenant. I'm paraphrasing some of this, but you read it and you'll see it. Everything I just said is right there in the book of Hebrews. The first time we hear of a shout from heaven and trumpets blowing from heaven is at Mount Sinai. The next time we hear of trumpets blowing in such profoundness is when they've come into the promised land and they're standing before Jericho. Seven priests with seven trumpets walking around that city day after day after day. And on the seventh day, they went around it seven times and they blew the trumpets and then the people started shouting, glory to God, the victory is ours. We would say, our victory is in Jesus, our Savior. Shout it out forever, you see? Oh, Satan covers his ears when we sing those kinds of praise songs. When we preach these kinds of messages, the demons scream. They cannot inhabit a place where the praise of God is going up before the throne of God. Are you with me, folks? Now, follow me. So we hear it at Mount Sinai. We see the power of those shouting trumpets at Jericho. We see them scattered throughout the Old Testament. But we hear them again spoken of, Matthew chapter 24. After Jesus is telling the disciples the signs of his coming, he ends it by saying, and after the tribulation of those days, the Son of Man will give the command. A shout from heaven with a trumpet blast He will signal to his angels from one end of the earth to the other to gather up his elect (sighs) with a trumpet blast after the tribulation of those days. And I will gather them unto me. And then the next thing he says, learn the lesson of the fig tree. Didn't I preach on that a few weeks ago? I showed you what that is right out of the scriptures and right out of the scholarship all the way back to the first generation of the early church. They knew what that meant. That's Israel being reborn in the last days. So he's telling us the shouting from heaven, the sounding of the shofar, the gathering up of God's people is going to happen sometime after Israel is born. But when Jesus said that, it would still be 2,000 more years before it happened or 1,948 years. It's amazing to think about, isn't it? But we're living in it. We're living 72 years the other side of it. Do you understand the prophetic days in which we're living? Amen, church? Okay. All right. Let me keep going. So we hear him say that there. Then we hear Paul say, some 30 years into the church age, 20 years into the church age, he's writing the church at Corinth. And in chapter 15, he writes about, look, I don't want you to be ignorant about the coming of the Lord and everything that's going to be happening and and yada, yada, yada. And he goes through this whole thing and he's he's trying to help them understand the last days because he's already been caught up to paradise. He's already had the vision. He had the first revelation. John's revelation was 30 years later. Of course, John's much more detailed. And Paul admits that. He said, there were things I saw that I was not permitted to tell. But the things I am permitted to tell, I'm going to tell you, your mind can't conceive. Your eye has never seen. Your ear has never heard. Over and over, he said, I'd rather leave this body and be with the Lord. But he says, my punishment is to stay with y'all. I didn't say I said that, brother. I said Paul said that. (laughs) Your punishment is to have me here for so long. Who said that? All right, kick him out. Who said amen? (laughs) Hugh said it. He's pointing to the precious woman in front of him. (laughs) 
<laughs> Y'all are great. I love preaching to this church. It's so much fun. Okay. So, the trumpets, Paul says, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, but here's what's going to happen. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we will all be changed. There we hear it again. Then Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says basically the same thing. He says, we will all be changed. We will be gathered up to be with the Lord at the sounding of the trumpet blast. Well, that's what Jesus said. Trumpet blast, the angel's going to come get you. After the tribulation of those days, he says, I'm coming back, but I'm getting my kids out of the way first. Why? Because I'm bringing a baseball bat for the rest of the world. Right? But I'm pulling my children off the playground. Because when I start swinging the baseball bat, there's some heads going to roll. But my kids have not been appointed unto the wrath that I'm getting ready to bring. Right? I mean, the word is very, very clear about this, folks. Big difference, big difference between tribulation and wrath. That's a whole other sermon. I don't want to get bogged down here. But the bottom line is, then, then, we hear all through the New Testament, especially from the writings of Paul, but even before then, and even from other writers, that Jesus is the Lamb of Passover. Jesus is the, the, the unleavened bread. He is our bread from heaven. Jesus is the first fruits risen from the dead. Jesus is the giver of the Holy Spirit, the birther of the church, and not only the birther of the church, but the head of the church. In fact, we are his body. The church is called his body now. So all of the first four feasts are fulfilled directly in that, and then you hear nothing about the fulfillment of those feasts in trumpets or atonement or tabernacle until you get to the book of Revelation. And what do we run straight into there? Seven churches, seven letters, seven trumpets. After that comes the bowls of wrath, the seven trumpets. Folks, that is a foreshadowing of the Feast of Trumpets. I, I, people will disagree with me. All over, A lot of people agree. I, I don't care. I, I know what Paul said. At the sounding of the last trumpet. Revelation chapter 10. He says, behold. At the sounding of the last trumpet, the mystery of God will be revealed. In Revelation chapter 10. I think it's about verse 20, 21, 22. Guess what? Guess what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He says, Behold, I tell you the mystery. When the last trumpet sounds, we will be caught up to be with him. And you get to the book of Revelation. When Paul says last trumpet, you know what that means? It means there had to be one before it, right? I mean, if he just said at the sounding of a trumpet, it'd be all kind of interpretations. He said the last trumpet, which means there's a, at least one more before it. It means there's a series of trumpets. There has to be at least two. If you're going to talk about the last one, there has to be a first one. Can somebody say amen? amen? Okay. Well, the only place where there's a series of trumpets, there's one in the Old Testament. You just read it. Seven priests, seven trumpets, surrounded by a bunch of guys from Hicker Hammock with guns, <laughs> marching seven times around the city, blowing the trumpets on the seventh day, how many times you got to hear the number seven to get the connection? And then the walls come tumbling down and God's people go up into the promised land. Then you come to Revelation. And the first thing we run into, seven trumpets. Now I've written a book about all that later. You can talk about that later. But I'm just saying, do you see the connection? It's the only other list. There's only other series of trumpets. Joshua and the book of Revelation. Paul says it's at the last trumpet. I know people say, yeah, but that was the rabbinical teaching on, and, the, and, and Yom Tawah. They do it on two days in Israel, and they blow a hundred trumpets, and the hundred and first trumpet is called the last trumpet. And hold it, hold it. These are also the same rabbis that took the Babylonian tradition and turned it into a New Year's that's not even in the Bible. These are also the same rabbis who put Jesus on the cross along with the Romans these are the same rabbis who are unbelievers in Jesus. I, 
I, these are the same rabbis who took Leviticus 23 where it says, on the first day of the seventh month, blow trumpets. And they said, you know what? I see what God's word says, but we're going to do it for two days. And we're going to do a hundred trumpets, and the hundred and first is this one, and this one, and there's certain ways to blow it, and certain tunes you have to do, and certain sounds you have to give, and we're going to put a whole series of laws. It's the same rabbis that took the commandment, observe the Sabbath, keep it holy, and they built 3,000 laws around how to do that. The same rabbis that took Jesus before the Caiaphas and then before Pontius Pilate and put him on a cross. Y'all look at me. I don't care what an unsaved rabbi says. All I, I stay in the Word of God, and the Word of God has only two lists of trumpets where there's a first and a last. One's in Joshua, the other's in Revelation. And Paul says at the blowing of the last trumpet, remember he was caught up to paradise before John was. John was caught up and he said, Paul was allowed to tell us about the last trumpet, what was going to happen. John says, I'm going to give you the seven trumpets. And you know what comes after the trumpets? The bowls of wrath. You know what that represents? The day of atonement. Because God's children are out of the way. Why? They're under the blood. Well, those not under the blood, what are they under? God's judgment. Because they rejected the offering of the high priest. So God's children are with the high priest now. And now the day of Yom Kippur has come. And everyone not under the blood, the wrath of God is poured out. Do you see that? You know how the book of Revelation ends? Chapter 21. Well, actually, it's chapter 22, but chapter 21 and 22 connect together. When John wrote it, he didn't put chapters. He's just talking. And look what he says. And behold, I saw the throne of God and him who sat upon it. And I heard his voice. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now among men. And he will tabernacle with them, and they will tabernacle with him. And behold, all things will be made new. There is no more pain, no more crying, no more death, no more weeping, no more mourning. Because God is tabernacling with his children. Give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Folks, it's all there. You just got to know how to piece it together. Well, how do I know how to do that? Study the Word. Read the Word. Well, I don't have all that time. I get it, and I'm not going to judge you for it. But you got a preacher that does. So be here on Sunday mornings. You got Sunday school teachers that do. Be in a Sunday school class. You got men's and women's Bible studies on Monday nights that do. Be in men and women's Bible studies. You understand what I'm saying? Sunday night, ask the preacher. Sunday night classes. I mean, you can get it as good as anybody else. But you got it. The word has to be a priority in your life. And then you can see the trumpet, the tuwa was blown at Mount Sinai, 10,000 angels. The tuwa was used again at Jericho. Blow the trumpets and shout. See, tuwa and tuwa. Blow the trumpets, seven of them, by seven priests, seven days, seven times, seven, 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 seven. What was he doing? Pointing to Revelation. What was Revelation doing? Pointing back to Joshua. Why Joshua? Because that's when God's people went up into the promised land at the blowing of trumpets. And at the last trumpet, the walls fell and they went to the... Do you see what I'm seeing? I don't know. People will argue this. They will cuss me. They will spit and holler. And then they'll say, well, Hal Lindsey says. Well, the rabbis say. And I love how Lindsay bless his heart, but I'm just like, yeah, but he ain't the Bible. And the rabbis that reject Jesus, they're not the word of God. I'm going to stick in the word, and you know what will happen the Bible. So today is Yom Tua. Today. It ends today. Now in Israel, it's a two-day celebration, so it started yesterday. But Leviticus 23 says, on the first day of the seventh month, blow it. Why? Because what's coming? It's a sound of what? You know what the trumpet sound is on that feast day, that moed? You know what it is? To those who love God and love his word. And now, on this side of the crucifixion, those who are under the blood, the sound of the trumpet. We're, for those of us that know the Lord, we, we long to hear that, don't we? 
I longed. I, I, I pray every day that the sky splits and the sign of the Son of Man is seen and the whole earth begins to mourn and I hear the and the next thing you know and here come the angels and here it happens. I long for that day. No more pain, no more crying, no more death. The old order of things passed away, ruling and reigning with the Lord. All of the beauty of the earth restored to its natural glory and paradise restored. Revelation 22, read that. And we get that. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit a cloud with a harp. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Everything the wicked people try to take from us and block us off from and oh, man-made global warming and Mother Earth is mad and Father Time and all, <sighs> all of that will be gone and it will be God and His glory and the angelic realm and the dimensions opened and we are fellow servants with them. And What if He begins to create a whole other universe? And he, you know what? You say, well, what's our part in that? We rule and reign with Him. Isn't that amazing to think about? I mean, give the Lord a hand. That's what lies ahead. We're not going to go sit on a cloud and, and strum a harp and we're all going to look like fat little babies, although some of us do now. But we won't. That's Greek mythology. Bible says. I look at the angels in the Bible. Those are some strong, tough dudes now. They're warriors. Powerful. One angel is going to change Satan and throw him into the lake of fire. One Go to Revelation 20, read it. One. One angel. Doesn't take 10,000 to handle him, old smut face. It's coming. Today, in Israel, they call it Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. Okay, well, that's, that's Babylonian rabbinical tradition, and that's fine. And, and the nation has fun, and they celebrate like we do New Year's Day and all that. And that, that's cool. I'm not disparaging that. I'm just saying that's not what the Bible says is the New Year, but that's cool. But they are celebrating Yom Tubah. And people like Zephariah, Messiah, Rabbi Zephariah, his wife Lynn, and all of those that he's led to the Lord and ministering in their lives, and they're watching right now, they understand, they get, they're probably amening and shouting, they're too awing right now. Because they understand the connection to all of this. They see it clearer than we do because they've lived in Orthodox tradition. And now they're seeing it in the light of the Word of God revealing and how it's all been about Jesus and it's still about Jesus and it's about us and about us ruling and reigning with Him. Some of you in this church have lost loved ones recently. Several of you have. Some of you have lost property and home damage and some of you have lost jobs and mess and you got kids or grandkids that are having trouble with addictions and problems and I get that, and I minister among you, and I love you, and we're going to get through this together, and we're going to do it all together, but here's the promise of God's word. God says, for my children, I promise you, I will make it right. There will be a day when there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. All of these things will pass away. I am on the throne. I behold, I'm making all things new. And you know when that day will begin? With the sound of a trumpet from heaven and it will be the last one the last one Paul said and we will be caught up and thus will we be with him forever more therefore encourage each other and comfort each other with these words the Bible says give the Lord a hand of praise give the Lord a hand of praise so, so now you know. Now you hear, you know, Rosh Hashanah in Israel, but you, you know the whole truth. You hear people say it's the Feast of Trumpets, and a lot of, lot of, lot of Gentile Christians in America don't even have a clue what that is. And I'm not disparaging. I'm just saying, they just don't. Zephrat, you know what he said about, several times. He said, Hickory Hammock. He says this is, this is the first and only Messianic Baptist church I've ever seen. <laughs> But, you know, we've never thought of that. We never call ourselves. We don't try to be anything. The 34 years I've been with you, I've been making these connections. And if you've been here that long, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, the whole Word of God connects. The fulfillment is in the New Testament. The fulfillment is in Jesus Christ. But it all began Genesis 1-1. And it moves forward to Revelation chapter 22. And you know what the book of Revelation says about Jesus? He is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, before God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he already had a plan for saving you. 
he was going to sacrifice his son as the lamb. Just like he, before he built the nation of Israel, he took the head of it, the father of it, Abraham. He said, now go sacrifice your only son on top of a mountain. What? Go do it, Abraham. Can you imagine? But right when he was holding the knife up, trembling, weeping, I can't believe God's going to make me do this. An angel of the, of the Lord grabbed his arm and stopped him and said, stop. I'm going to add these words. This is my contextual interpretation of it, but this is what happened, and this is what it was about, and the Bible makes it clear. He grabbed his arms, and he said, now you know what it feels like, don't you, boy? See, but I'm going to spare your son, your only son. Over there in the thicket is a lamb. Go get the lamb and put him up here. Abraham got it. You know what he said? He said, from now on, this is called the mountain of the Lord. You know what it was called? Moriah. You know what Moriah means in Hebrew? To see God. It also means, in another context, to be seen by God. You know where Jesus was crucified? Moriah. Where we were seen by God in the flesh, hanging on a cross. And where we looked up and saw God. God says, I'm not going to require that you give your only son, but I wanted you to get a taste because I'm going to give my only son in this place. It all ties together. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, and by him all things were made. The heavens, the earth, the universe, everything that has been made was made by him. All things were made by him and for him, and in him all things hold together. It's all about Jesus. That's why this church is all about Jesus. That's why every sermon I preach and Brother Greg preaches and our teachers in our Sunday school classes, we do our best to make sure it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Yom Tua. It's all about Jesus. The trumpets the victory, the going into the promised land, the be joining with our Lord in heaven, the angels coming to get us, the trumpet sounding at the command of God, the shouting to God, shout to the Lord, all ye earth, to wah, to the Lord, to wah, to wah, to wah, yom to wah. It's today. Yeah, but it comes every year and it has for thousands of years. I know, but it ain't never come after 2020. And you can't find a church to go to for the first time in the church's history. It ain't never come in that day. It ain't never come 72 years after the rebirth of Israel that hadn't been a nation for 2,800 years. It hadn't come after China and Russia and North Korea and the collapse of the Middle East and 9-11 and Iraq and Afghanistan and the collapse of borders and, and, and socialists taking over the nation and the Constitution being thrown to the ground and and, and the greatest Christian nation on the earth declaring marriage can be anything you want it to be and whatever's in the womb is not sacred at all but an eagle's egg and a turtle's egg, we'll put you in prison for that. It ain't come that. This, we are living in the midst. I'm going to call it a prophetic mess and I'm not trashing prophecy, but I'm saying it's a conglomeration of prophetic happenings that have just tangled themselves together and converging at once and most of the church doesn't even see. You know what most of the church does? They eat and they drink and they're given in marriage and they buy and they sell. Jesus said, and it'll be just like that. Just like the days of Noah. And the flood came and washed them all away. Except for God's people who were taken up in the ark when God came with his baseball bat. Are y'all hearing me? So I'm saying right now, Go out of here with your heads held high. Yes, you'll be mocked. Yes, Jericho walls will holler at you and say, that's all you've got. And you just say, like this precious woman said a minute ago, that's all we need. Prove it. Look at Hickory Hammock. Here's a little teeny example. 11 months we trusted in God's word. We're still ministering. We're still here. We're just fine. We're just fine. Yeah, yeah, that's all we need. Are y'all hearing me? Because I'm convinced that all things work together for good. 
for those who know the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Give the Lord a hand of praise. I want you to have a word of prayer with me. Pastor Jim will come and dismiss us in a moment. Right when Pastor Jim comes, I'm telling our folks that are listening and watching by, by live stream, right when Pastor Jim comes, we're going to cut the video feed because I need just a few moments alone with my church family here as we're in the midst of trying to recover. And I just don't want the whole world to know every little detail about what we're doing and where we're going to be, etc. So you'll understand that. Very seldom do we do this, but we're going to do it this morning. But I'm so glad you were able to worship with us. Church family, let's pray.